Good afternoon. I'm Bruce Avery, a member of RTO uh, District 3 from Algoma. I'm joined this afternoon by uh, Loretta McKay, Moira O'Pally, Rich Prophet, Diane Marshall, Mary Johns, and John Fleming, who are all members of District 3 as well from uh, Sault Ste. Marie and Algoma. Uh, RTO, or Retired Teachers of Ontario, is a voluntary organization uh, which welcomes uh, people who uh, have retired from education in Ontario and provides us with uh, social opportunities, uh, opportunities to buy uh, insurance, health and travel insurance. Uh, RTO Ontario also uh, lobbies on behalf of seniors uh, with uh, the provincial government and the federal government. Uh, Rich is the uh, current vice president of the Ontario uh, teachers and Rich would you like to add anything to that? Well yes Bruce, uh, in addition to the insurance that we talk about actually there are 31 areas of being benefits to uh, being a member of RTO. Uh, it's very extensive as we said, we have the opportunity to volunteer. We have the opportunity to grow people as they progress in time. Uh, we have the uh, numerous opportunities to, in fact, I would say it's something like a professional development day without any professional development. It's an opportunity to meet new people, to enjoy people, and to grow as individuals. Thank you, Richard. And it is a very special year for the uh, Retired Teachers of Ontario. This is our 50th anniversary. And uh, as part of our local recognition of 50 years of uh, being part of the organization and uh, having service to others, we thought it would be very appropriate to highlight a few of the people that uh, make contributions to our uh, local society. And I'd like to start with Mary Johns. Um, the uh, Ontario uh, teachers uh, give us a grant every, uh, or can apply for a grant every year uh, under service uh, to other, others. And one that uh, we have been part of for a number of years is the uh, vision screening, and Mary's been involved with that. So Mary, could you just tell us a little bit about what's involved with the uh, vision screening program? Yes, thank you, Bruce. Well, Vision Screening began in 2008. It was a joint venture between the Lions Club of Sault Ste. Marie and the Retired Teachers of Ontario. So it is to help identify vision concerns in kindergarten children. We mainly screen senior kindergarten children in both school boards, and they encompass 27 schools from Mountain View to the north to Central Algoma and St. Joseph Island to the east. We have 24 wonderful, dedicated volunteers for this job. 21 of those volunteers are members of RTO. By the end of this school year, we will have screened 829 children. And so far, we've identified 168 students that have concerns with their vision. It is estimated that one in six children have vision problems. So screening is designed to identify children who have difficulty with seeing at a distance, seeing up close, and seeing with both eyes working together. Now this is a vision screening. It's not a complete eye exam by a doctor. So the Ontario Association of Optometrists recommends that annual eye exams for school-aged children be done before school begins. And they are covered by OHIP. So since 80% of what children learn comes from their eyes and vision. It is important to detect any vision problems before they affect a child's performance at school. And as educators, we know that we want each child to succeed in learning. So this vision screening program really helps in reaching that goal. Thank you, Mary. So uh, these children that we've identified that have a, a problem, are they then referred to uh, a uh, note goes home on the form to their to their parents, letting them know that there was a concern detected, and that we would recommend that they would see an optometrist. Yeah, very good. Thank you. So, as an example of uh, retired teachers working with uh, young very students coming so. into the uh, school system. Yes. Now, Rich, you're involved with another project which uh, deals with a different segment of our society, and uh, again, 
in cooperation with another organization. Uh, Festival of che Trees, which is an annual event in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, would you explain that for us, please? Yes, the Festival of Trees is an extraordinary charity fundraiser. Actually, it is a wonderland of festive decorations and uh, activities to be enjoyed by the whole family, by friends and visitors to Sault Ste. Marie. And the location itself, it's transformed into a winter utopia of trees and wreaths. Our RTO members have been the annual mainstay of this activity for the past 19 years since its inception. And as coordinator of the volunteers, I've received numerous calls throughout the years. Some have said, Rich, why wasn't I invited to be a volunteer last year? <laughs> Others have said, please, let me volunteer for the Festival of Trees this year. And oddly, it becomes quite difficult to select only 100 to 120 volunteers for this activity. Now, the Festival of Trees is not merely a family event to be noted on the calendar. Many people see this as a kickstart to the Christmas season but it's also a major fundraiser for the City of Sault Ste. Marie and the Lung Association. Grace Briglio, the head of the local Lung Association here in Sault Ste. Marie, she's indicated that last year $100,000 was raised and stayed in this city and that that $100,000 will fund the, the tobacco-free program which will be presented to all the grade four students in each and every school in the city of Sault Ste. Marie. So the Festival of Trees is a fantastic organization for all people concerned, Bruce. It's a great organization. Again, funds coming back to the Sioux and helping all different age groups, right. But I, you work at the hospital as a volunteer. Could, uh, I understand a number of teachers are involved uh, in, in that project. That's right, Bruce. In 1994, I retired after um, 40 plus, span of 40 plus years of teaching in the elementary school system. And after such a rewarding career, I looked out into the community to see where I could be of some help out there. And a friend of mine suggested that I join her at the information desk in our hospital. And Almost 24 years later, you can still find me there, a proud member of the Sault Ste. Marie uh, Hospital Volunteer Association, uh, SAH. And uh, since I joined, in all the years I've been there, I've been so amazed at the number of retired teachers and RTO members that are coming out, giving their time unselfishly, hour after hour, year after year, it's unbelievable. There are over 500 and some volunteers who give thousands of hours every year uh, to um, our community members as they uh, are in the hospital. As you uh, uh, enter the hospital, you look around, you'll see a lot of people with red coats, red vests, and these are our volunteers in every area of the hospital who will help to uh, make the person, the patient coming in, or anybody's uh, visit positive. They go out of their way. Um, I, I, they're so pleasant, and uh, it's, it's hard to um, believe uh, what they do for people, how many uh, hours they put in. And for um, um, future retirees, you might want to think about um, this amazingly gratifying uh, way to give back to the community by joining your fellow teachers there and uh, helping to make our community a happy, happier and healthier one. Well, thanks, Loretta. I know from my personal experience, I, I've really appreciated the volunteers at the hospital at times because it's a, it's a big, complicated organization and you go in for an well appointment. Run, and very it, well run. It's really nice to have someone say, come on, here's where you are. and this is this is the office and then you go help you through uh, the unknown another big area 
sort of the same season as Christmas with Trees is uh, the Christmas cheer. And uh, Diane, uh, you're no stranger to Sault Ste. Marie and the people in Sault Ste. Marie have been involved with Christmas cheer for a number of years uh, as the chairperson. And uh, uh, I know many of us work along with you, but uh, yes. certainly would like to hear your comments. Well, I've been involved since uh, I retired, just like Loretta, right off the bat in 1997 and I've convened it since 2004, so I've been around a bit. And uh, I was really astounded that I knew we had a lot of teachers involved and dedicated to the, the in, uh, Christmas cheer program, but when I finally counted, there are about a third of our volunteers are teachers. Yes. And uh, we, have, we operate for six weeks out of a major depot, wherever that might be. We, we sort of change every year. And uh, out of the 160, 80 people that filter through the door every day, some teachers work, uh, or our volunteers, I mean, work every day for the six weeks as we prepare the food baskets and get the toys ready and, uh, and uh, some come two days a week it's whatever they can uh, share but some are very dedicated and they are there constantly and so through their process of helping us uh, we provide uh, baskets food baskets and gifts for the children and mitts and tubes and scarves and that as well for the family for about 16 to 1800 families every year and over 4,000 people. Wow. So, um, and then that's just, I'm just counting that at the, our major depot, but then all of the baskets in that go out to 50 sub depots in the community and they are staffed. So I'm not sure how many Other teachers teacher are involved. in the sub depots right. too. So we yep. are very, uh, we're very fortunate to, to have this dedicated group, and many of them be teachers. They make, I call it the magic. What the magic many, happens. You know, right. What, how many families were helped with Christmas cheer? Uh, between 1,600 and 1,800 families we help each year. And I know there's a number of other organizations involved. Do you happen to have any idea how many other oh, I, organizations? Oh, I really don't, because we have a, a lot of different organizations as well as office departments, and it, and they they dedicate their Christmas party to Christmas cheer, and uh, then we also have companies that donate. We had a, uh, two new companies come on board this year on stuff a truck, stuff a trailer, and uh, like with Christie Brothers and Prouse uh, Motors, and that was a new adventure, well. and and uh, so there are all these new initiatives coming because people wish to be part of that. Yeah, so you said the, <clears throat> there's a lot of coordination involved, obviously. You said like you, this, this, this is a short time in the fall, but That's it actually right. is longer than that. But yeah. I would think from your it, standpoint. It goes on almost all year. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it's certainly a great program, and uh, I know a lot of us really enjoy being well, you're involved. Part of the yeah, I, well, I, my, <laughs> one, my one day a year, yeah, the turkey. Bar. My, I hate to yeah, say that, right, but there uh, is this turkey team, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, to make sure that all the turkeys and the, and the hams are lined up when they get to the yeah, right baskets yeah. and that. Help so with the packing. It does take, yeah. Yes, and it. That day reminds me of a beehive that is just it so is. so busy with uh, this part working and this part working, but it, it all comes together it does. thanks to the coordination. Yeah, it does come together. Yeah. Myra, you've been involved with the, uh, a number of organizations in the Sioux over the years, and uh, I think currently you're volunteering on the uh, library board. That is correct, Bruce. Uh, this is my 10th uh, year as a member of the uh, public library board, and I'm finding it very challenging, very interesting, and very busy. There are uh, 11 members uh, on the board, and half of them are either active or retired teachers. It seems to be a natural path for teachers to follow into education and books and, and, and training for the rest of their lives. We have 10 monthly meetings, and we have many committees uh, to help run the library, and our task is governance. We set the policy, we have to follow the library's affairs under the Ontario Public Libraries Act. Uh, we set the agenda, we oversee staffing, we assume uh, fiduciary matters like the budget, we set fees, we carry out strategic plans, and uh, it's a very, very busy place. 
We have a mission statement that reads, one stop, endless possibilities. And that's exactly what it is. And our, that includes financial management, people, community, products, and the environment. Uh, we have activities for every age group from preschool to seniors. We have seminars on all the time, whether they're senior driving, health, education, election candidates, gardening, book chats, chess, cultural activities, you name it, it's there. And I'm sure that I'm speaking to the choir here because you've probably been part of it and you've probably attended all of these. Uh, we also have a, a minor group that is called Friends of the Library. And this is a group of about 60 people who have a little store downstairs in the Cent Centennial Library. They recycle books, they sell books, they have a store there, they have uh, workshops. They, they raised last year alone $30,000. And this money goes back into the library to buy things that are very <coughs> badly needed as, as uh, we have uh, cut budgets in the last few years and sometimes yes. can't buy the things that we need. So they're a great help and they're wonderful people. With the ever-increasing internet and social media, we uh, certainly try to keep up and you'll see people in there every day working on it. The young people have a new digital lab in their house. They're just delighted. And a 3D printer and all those new things uh, that uh, people need these days. As you know, the Centennial Branch is 50 years old now. It was uh, built in 1967 <coughs> for Centennial year. And uh, it's in very bad condition. One thing about new libraries is that they, they no longer are going to be buildings that stand alone. They're going to be hubs that connect. And we're very proud of the Cora branch of the library, which is now in the Cora Community Center, uh, so it can tap into the senior group that's down there or people going in and out of sports activities. <coughs> and, uh, a brand new, uh, larger hub is being planned for Alexander Henry, probably 219, where we can uh, coordinate with all the schools in the area. Part of that uh, building is a French immersion school. And the greatest thing of all is uh, with the space we will have, we will be able to be, perhaps, we hope, start a very large archives uh, for all of the city archives because most of them are in cardboard boxes in basements. And that'll be a real thing for the future. So it's, uh, I, I really enjoy the work here. There's a lot that I don't know, uh, but I certainly enjoy it. And I just wanted to add that in conclusion here, that I, as an RTO member, I'm in charge of membership. And at the present time, we have about 1,150 members in Algoma. And I would be willing to bet that 1,100 of them volunteer just like I do. I think you're probably right, Moira. And I'd like to thank you for your work on the library board because it's one of my frequent stops. I'm sure uh, it is. And make good use of it. <laughs> and John, last but not least in this group, you're involved with the arts, and uh, you brought to me to tears a couple of times, and not at work, but in the theater, John. And I'd like you to talk just briefly about the arts and the Sioux, would you please? Okay. Um, I've been involved in the arts well, forever, and I think most teachers are involved in the arts. And I think um, as far as being a member of RTO and, and how we can help the community, I think teachers do a lot in that regard. Um, as you get to a certain age in life, you may not be able to take those uh, leading roles on stage anymore, but, but I think um, teachers have organizational abilities. They've spent their lives planning. They've spent their lives public speaking. Um, they're not afraid to get up and front of people and, and uh, organize a meeting or, or state their opinions. And I think this is where RTO members have helped the arts organizations because they are willing to take on executive roles. They may not be front and center on stage or in the choir or whatever, but they're working behind the scenes. Their time to be in the spotlight perhaps has passed. But uh, you know, some of us keep on plugging away, but uh, um, they have many talents to offer organizations. So I think just the, um, the changes to the, the Community Theatre Centre was initiated with uh, a lot of teacher support and continues to do so. You know, people like Brian Wilson and, and Bob Cooper who continue to offer 
opportunities for youth out of uh, those facilities. And I think of people like um, um, Noreen Harrison, who uh, is very active in the Arts Council and uh, helps to the coordinating, uh, coordination of all of the various uh, artistic uh, endeavors. The arts in Sault Ste. Marie are so broad. Um, when you think of, well, Bruce mentioned me being on stage, so there's the performing arts aspect. Uh, I've been a long time member of the Musical Comedy Guild, but the Sioux Theatre Workshop, Harry Houston is a mainstay in that organization, and as we speak, as we speak Perry is probably in Elliott Lake now with the Quanta Festival, you know, supporting the other actors in, in uh, those organizations. Um, who else do I have here? Oh, Joe Lozon, the Theatre St. Mary's and Maria Burgess have done wonders with the, the youth in the community and, and still continue to do so in retirement. Um, in the uh, musical arts, we have the festival choir, we, Mary Madonna's and mainstay in that. Also, Mary offers her talents at a Wednesday afternoon dance session with her combo at the Legion Hall. Um, teachers are involved in that. Uh, the late Art or Lady Sicola used to be very much involved in that uh, endeavor as well, too. Um, Sonia Mazzotti directs the Seniors Choir at the, the uh, Senior Center. And then performing arts, we have the whole visual arts aspect with painters and potters and, and uh, fabric uh, people who work in fabrics like Gail Sacro and Russ Mason and Karen Nisbet and you know, the list goes on and on. These are all retired teachers who are still contributing to their colleagues in the community. So, um, I know a lot of them uh, run workshops for, oh, for others and share their share their talents. Exactly. Yes. It's yeah. and I'm so proud to be sort of affiliated with many many of these people. And, and uh, I feel we're so lucky in Sault Ste. Marie with our arts team. I've, <clears throat> like you, I like I like going particularly to musicals, and I have gone to Toronto to see presentations and come back here and seen them an identical presentation and thought the amateur presentation was better than the uh, than the professional I've heard some comments about that they're not always not there, always but, but I have had that experience and <laughs> yes. uh, and uh, we have such a variety of people and we are so much talent exactly Thank you very much, everyone. I enjoyed oh, this uh, you, brief uh, Thank conversation. You. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. As did we. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs>
to get the camp ready for the season or at the end of the year when we're closing the camp, we can always use extra hands at that point that they contribute in this way. Some have come down and have been a chaplain uh, for the week wow. for the camps. You know, Cheryl, it seemed to me a while back Retired teachers as an organization applied for a grant and we applied for a grant for Camp McDougall because we believe so much in the good things happening there. And that was for renovations, I believe. Yes, it was. And we were very, very appreciative of getting that money because it helped us uh, to do some reconstruction of some of our buildings that we had. Um, Approximately four years ago, uh, the Thessalon area was hit with a microburst, and that included the camp and our lodge that we called Elma Lodge, which it slept some of the staff and a first aid area and so on, was totally destroyed and had to be removed. Well, along with that were a number of trees that had to come down, so that's all having to be replaced and we're in a process of replacing that as we go on and we get the funds available. But yes, without the grant from RTO, we wouldn't have been able to do some of the uh, upgrading that we did from that money. Fogo, as you know, I'm a strong supporter of the arts, especially the Barbara Shop course. I want to thank you today for making time, making time to talk not only about the beauty and harmonies you bring into our city, but also for the beauty of what you do for children and adults in speech and language pathology at our hospital. This we are proud to say as one of our RTO members, Fogo Della Vadova. My name is Fogo Della Vadova. I'm the proud second vice president of RTO, the Retired Teachers of Ontario. And I'm also the proud president of the Northland Barbershop Chorus. And this year, uh, RTO is celebrating its 50th anniversary and the Northland Barbershop Chorus celebrated its 50th anniversary in 2010 uh, where we were the proud recipients of the Sault Ste. Marie Medal of Merit. Uh, we sing every year, for example, at uh, Station Mall. Uh, we uh, do some caroling at our hospital. Uh, we also get invited uh, to a number of uh, church services that we do. And we also sing at uh, quite a number of long-term care homes. And so we're really proud of our RTO members who have decided to volunteer their talents uh, with our particular organization. And uh, we strive to improve the quality of life, in this case through the arts, through theater, through music. And we're really uh, happy and proud to do that. And there's great camaraderie among all the uh, members of our, both the chorus and the RTO membership too. So we're really proud of that, and we're really proud to be celebrating the 50th anniversary this year for RTO. I'm Bernice Whalen, a proud member of Retired Teachers of Ontario, sometimes known as RTO, ERO. Retirement can be an ideal time to become a resource and a guiding light for those in need. Every little bit counts. And today, we're going to share what some of our members do in order to be that guiding light within our community. I welcome Joanne Mantha McConnell, Kathy Greeny, <laughs> our president, Rich Prophet. Rita Wagner, <laughs> Jean Hutley, and Gail Manley. Thank you for making time. When I think of Joanne, I think of the many hours that she contributes in different areas. But right now, today, Joanne's going to share 
a little bit about her experiences and volunteering at ARCH. Yes, thanks Bernice. We're very pleased that a group of uh, teachers from both school boards in our city volunteer at ARCH on a regular basis. Uh, we're also very happy that the uh, Director of Education from uh, Huron Superior, uh, John Stavick, is on the Board of Directors. And in total, there are 140 volunteers at ARCH who contribute and volunteer on a regular basis. <coughs> and the um, uh, fundraising activities raise $750,000 a year toward running uh, ARCH Hospice. The website is an excellent resource for anyone interested in uh, volunteering, and we encourage even more teachers to come out and to volunteer. And if you were interested in volunteering, you would complete an application form and then meet with Julie Primo, who is the coordinator of volunteer services. Uh, you would have a police check, and um, you would begin uh, uh, volunteering in an area of interest for you. Uh, there is also a palliative care course, which helps you understand the journey at end of life, which is uh, highly recommended and, and very, very enriching. The volunteers uh, who, who work at ARCH, they help out in uh, the kitchen. There is a food preparation course that can be taken that allows you to understand uh, the, uh, the hygienic aspect of food preparation. We have uh, people who help in the office with data entry and work with, uh, with the computers. We also have people who work in the, uh, in the yard and the garden. As, as you know, the, the yard is beautiful and the gardens are beautiful. Uh, we have people who help out with building maintenance. And uh, we, we also have uh, people who make phone calls because we, uh, we call people and thank them for their contributions. And those are hundreds and hundreds of phone calls that are made by the, by the volunteers. Uh, we also provide complementary therapy, such as art therapy or Reiki or um, uh, massage therapy for the residents uh, upon their request. So overall, it's a very enriching uh, place to be. And the ARCH cares for the emotional, the psychological, the spiritual, and the physical needs of the families and their residents. And uh, we're very happy that in June, the pediatric room will open for uh, pediatric uh, needs and people will not have to travel out of town for that. And so the, um, the hospice is a place of, uh, of serenity and a place of fulfilling end of life wishes. Joanne, I, I know that our community just strongly believes so much in that dignity for end of life. But what's even more joy in our hearts as retired teachers is this year, as they're trying to get the pediatric ward off the ground, our local District 3 is contributing $2,000 to that endeavor. We're yes. proud to do that. Yes. And we want to support in every way, not only physically, but also with that labor of love that you demonstrate when you go there. Thank yes. you for doing that. Rita, now you can wear many hats and that I know, okay? But today I invited you to wear the hat of a volunteer at St. Vincent's Place and the soup kitchen. Busy, busy lady you are. Yes, yes. Well, I've been involved with St. Vincent Place right from the beginning, so that would probably be 16, 17 years ago uh, because I, Tony Martin has started the community soup kitchen at Blessed Sacrament, and then Jim Padden came from Elliott Lake uh, with his wife to start the St. Vincent de Paul uh, soup kitchen. So I was there when everything was falling apart and whatever, and I worked in the office, I worked all over the place. But St. Vincent de Paul uh, place is made up of four uh, sections. There's the men's shelter, and it has permanent and itinerant residents. We have the thrift shop. The money that's raised in the thrift shop goes towards uh, paying for utilities and repairs and food for the shelter. We have the food bank, which the citizens of Sault Ste. Marie have been really, really helpful with the blue box uh, it, uh, in September. So a lot of money, or, and money and 
uh, food is donated there. And then we have the soup kitchen. And the soup kitchen, I'm part of, um, there are seven teams. And we uh, prepare a hot meal on Wednesday night. And then we have different teams on Saturday that prepare a lunch of soup and sandwich. Now, uh, so Wednesday night, um, I have to look around the Sioux in the grocery stores and see what the deals are because we have anywhere from 60 some to 125 people that we serve. So you're trying to make something that will stretch in case we have 125 and if there are some leftovers, well then, leftovers, so then that, the men upstairs will have something for the next day too. Uh, so I'm always looking for deals and um, we try to give them uh, protein, uh, carbohydrate, salad if it's feasible, um, not at two dollars a head, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but we try and give them a balanced meal and, uh, and that, so um, that's, that's about I mean, I know it's a lot of work because we go there about one o'clock in the afternoon and we were finished about seven. So it's a, it's a long day because we have to do the, but I do have a helper, Mikos. He's uh, a chef by trade and he's been volunteering and helping uh, the teams and that, especially our team, the Knights of Columbus team. And, uh, so. You know, Rita, there's many as a time I've spotted you in the yard at a grocery store, oh. running out with the cart that was filled to capacity. Oh, yeah. wow. and, I, and I thought, oh my goodness, this woman is phenomenal. But we have so many people out there yes. who are doing phenomenal things yeah. in their retirement. And I'm so proud. Thank yeah. you for sitting oh, beside oh, me. Oh, you're welcome. Here. Um, I am going to turn at this point to somebody who brings beauty into this world. And I mean beauty. I'm accused of having a purple thumb, but thank goodness I have a spouse that has a green one. You do such wonderful things to make our city a nicer place to be. Jean Huntley from the Horticultural Society. Well, we're a small but mighty group. Um, and we're, we're um, Many of our participants are teachers and retired teachers, and we our focus is on um, public education and food security. So we're trying to bring information to people who want to garden for their own for themselves, and also to help people grow their own, and either for the pleasure of flowers or to produce food for their use or to donate. Mm -hmm. Quite a few people do donate to the soup kitchen mm -hmm. and whatnot. So you may you may be familiar, our, our most recent event was CD Saturday, which right. we had just a, a week and a half ago, where we're really bringing in um, a donated seeds that are packaged by volunteers and then sold to the pu public for a nominal fee, 20 50 cents a package, um, which is enough, you know, for a row of radish or whatever, yeah. and a huge variety of seeds, all of which are, most of which, rather, are saved and packaged by members. And um, we also host a lot of vendors at that event that are promoting education um, or food security. So we had presentations on worm composting and um, seed saving in particular, that, that kind of thing. Our, our next upcoming event, which is really dependent on volunteers, is our plant sale, which happens, I think it's the 19th of May. And there are, for the most part, donated plants, uh, rescued plants, that we parcel up and um, arrange for a, day, a morning long sale, all very reasonably priced. That, Money then goes into uh, um, some of our activities, like we support um, the therapeutic garden at the Sioux Area Hospital. We make donations to that. We um, the memorial garden in Bellevue Park, the Rose Memorial Garden. Um, we're very involved with the city beautification in in uh, 
sponsoring awards and in judging for the awards, that kind of thing. So um, we have volunteers who grow seedlings for the uh, gardens at the, the Sioux Canal. So those are, are uh, for the most part, donated and um, grown and donated by our members. We uh, are great supporters of community gardens. And the, the move from, the recent move from the Allard Community Garden to the new Forest mm -hmm. Heights Community Garden was essentially a huge amount of um, volunteer hours. We had, we did have wonderful community support, but the volunteers were literally moving plants, moving hardscape, moving dirt. <laughs> mm -hmm. We were, and, and that will uh, have its official opening, I believe, in April or June, I'm not sure, June, I think. Um, and uh, the gardens, in fact, also sponsor other organizations where their uh, members can grow food for their own use, so, or, or have their members participate in the gardening experience. So it's uh, a lot going on. Yeah. You know, when you think of our communities sometimes hurting, to be able to grow your own food always gives you an option. Yeah. And to have that support yeah. to do that yeah. means so much. And you know, it's not just about making this a beautiful place to be no. in Sault Ste. No. Marie. It's far beyond that, but a beautiful place to be part of because of the caringness and the volunteerism goes there to donate those hours to make it happen. And, and we have, our public education program involves things like having a speaker come in and talk about growing your own backyard fruit trees or building a, a pollinator house for your backyard, those kinds of things. And our monthly meetings are open to the public. Most people are members, but the public's always welcome to come. Thank you for that invite. Well, Kathy Grady, Again, you're a lady with many, many hats. But today, we're going to focus on two very big endeavors that make a difference in our community. Kathy, one of the things I didn't know for years, but I am glad you're involved with Retina House. And would you give us a little peek preview of some of the wonderful things that reach out because of of our Certain, presence. Certainly. Now, I just want you to know that um, in, in addition to myself, Jean Huntley is also a <laughs> member of the board of directors for Breton House and New Link. Um, I'm going to give you the real name, which is the Algoma Substance Abuse Rehabilitation Center, but it's better known as Breton House and New Link. Breton House and the New Link provide women's addiction services um, and have for more than 30 years in this community. Now, Breton House is a residential women's recovery home. Because of the way things are set up in Ontario, Breton House is essentially open to women from across the province to be there in the residential setting. Usually they find that um, it's easier to be in a recovery home outside your home community. So that's why um, the recovery homes across Ontario are open to any resident of Ontario. A new link is relatively new. It's a harm reduction storefront program and it serves pregnant and parenting women with addictions. So it is on Queen Street and um, they provide service, not only individual counseling service, but they also provide programs that um, women who are either pregnant or who parent um, are invited to come. There's also a, a, child, a child center there for, people, for, for, for children if they need to bring children. The mission of Breton House and New Link is to improve the health and well-being of women with substance use issues by offering opportunities for growth and change. So it's a place when you talk about light, okay? We, Breton House and A New Link are, are two facilities that are providing light to people who need to follow that light. Um, at this time, 
on our board of directors, which is essentially um, a governance board. Um, we have four RTO ERO members who are part of that board, including Jean. And we are very fortunate to have them, and they provide a, a real um, difference in, in, in perspective because we have two secondary school teachers, we have two elementary school teachers, so it provides a different um, perspective on a lot of things in our governance board. Well, Kathy, you know what, it, it, it's not only these young women, but I could say the young women and the children they're going to bring into these communities that you're making a difference with the present, but also the future generations. And we're really appreciative of that and our presence being in that kind of activity. There was a second aspect we were going to touch upon it. It's one that actually was initiated uh, with Gail Manley with uh, uh, initiating scholarships. And you took the hand over to make this happen for a while, fiscally for our own community. Um. The um, scholarships that RTOER District 3 provide um, are for Algoma University and Sioux College. Um, these scholarships are awarded to a second year full-time student. The criteria includes a significant commitment to volunteering, surprise, surprise, when we're talking about <laughs> volunteering in our community. Um, over the past 18 months, that's the time that they've been in school. Um, good academic standing and also um, financial need because that's an an another important part. We have been funding this program for the last few years by holding a silent auction. And the silent auction is at our annual general meeting over the lunch hour. Our members make donations of items that can be auctioned off. Then our members all bid on those items and some are successful bidders, some are not. And we also have a, a donation jar. And as a result of this over the lunch hour silent auction, we've been able to generate um, between $1,100 and $1,200 each year that support our scholarship program. So we are really fortunate that we have um, members who um, are so committed to scholarships within, um, within our community. Um, we have a bit of a joke that the items that we want in our, in, in our um, silent auction need to be um, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Useful, consumable, or edible. And that's because we're all old and we don't need more stuff. So we want things that are appropriate for us to use. So that, that's another part of it. And we are certainly fortunate for the generosity of our members over a lunch hour. Who would have thought, right? Oh, you, you know what? If you plant a seed, you get a, a bigger plant. You've planted <laughs> seeds here and they're showing fruition. Gail. I like, I like that metaphor. You like that metaphor. <laughs> you like it. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> that was my greener side of the purple yeah, yeah. thumb. Uh, Gail, you, uh, you're like seeing a, a, a zooming comet across the sky because yeah, there's yeah, so yeah. many different things I could have approached you about. But I did approach you <laughs> about daily home volunteerism, because somehow I always end up there with you. And also the, um, the domestic violence, the Algoma Council on Domestic Violence, and this, your involvement with Santa. Our presence as teachers are being felt in many areas. And I'd like you to just share some of the things from these aspects that you have managed to bring forward on our behalf. Thanks, thanks, Bernice, very much. And by the way, after hearing everybody, I already want other places I want to volunteer, <laughs> like Arch and, yeah. uh, and yeah. Yeah. Soup Kitchen. I've already, you know, sort of, that's what happens with us, I think, yes. in retirement. We're, before we retire, we're, service is part of our life. And then yeah. once we retire, we, we look to reach out and see where else we can, uh, our talents can be used. Um, a lot of the things that I got involved in, I was involved in before. So, for example, the Algoma Council on Domestic Violence. Mm -hmm. I, um, I started to sit there as a, a, a teacher, uh, uh, an 
active teacher. I was the president of the local teachers, and then I continued after I retired. But what I got interested in, of course, is the women's issues focus and domestic violence. And, um, <clears throat> but they needed someone, they were looking for someone to d make presentations on domestic violence. And there's a program that's been developed by the University of Western Ontario and uh, the Ontario Women's Directorate called Neighbors, Friends and Family. And it's basically uh, bringing out the signs and possible uh, of domestic violence in a situation because the people around the victim often know what's going on, but they just don't know quite how to deal with it. So I became the local, they called it the community animator, which I always quite liked the title, <laughs> animator. It sounded like zooming, as you were saying, but, which is not really my mode. But um, so I, I've been doing those presentations for a number of years, and then they changed to be um, domestic violence in the workplace. Uh, and we had a program called Make It Our Business, and I've also been doing presentations on for hair salon professionals called Cut It Out. So it's kind of a program that's developed a little bit. Um, the other piece of it is, um, it's a little side shoot from that, is presentations on elder abuse, which mm -hmm. I've uh, done a couple now. I've just, I was just trained a year ago to do it. One was at the Central Algoma Women Teachers, Retired Women Teachers Group, and then most recently at um, Central United Church uh, Women's you know, U UCW there. So it's, it's sort of, I guess it's a little bit similar, like it's still in the same area. So, um, but I think once a teacher, always a teacher, because it seems to be give me a microphone or give me something like that, I like to <laughs> jabber. All of you are smiling, you may know. Um, but uh, we, with the Zonta Club, we have got involved in a number of different things, but one of them is our connection with Ovarian Cancer Canada. Yes. And um, well, there are 10 of us, uh, several of whom are retired teachers, but who are trained to give the Knowledge is Power presentations, which uh, Rita, I, I, with your group, out in, uh, out in, Prince. Out in Prince Township, and you also were over with the RW in uh, Sioux City unit and had a, a team come and present. Yes. Well received. And one of the, well one, those two were, uh, was a retired teacher, Dorothy yeah. Mott. Okay. So we, we, we seem to be uh, involved in different things like that. Now the Davy Home was actually something that we decided as a retired teacher group to, um, they look for, uh, their volunteer team looks for people to be in the tuck shop. And we probably have about 12 to 15 people that are available, maybe maybe closer to 20 actually, Kathy, because mm -hmm. Kathy and Bernice are involved in that. Um, and we do it for uh, a week, two week stints, two one week stints. That's right. Um, and usually October, November. Um, and it's, it's great fun. We really like it. Basically, you see people you know coming in and out, and we also mm -hmm. like to visit with the residents while we're there. It's so, so joyful. It That's is. when I managed to see some of our members who were singing and entertaining there, and I was just so joyful to be able to experience that. And also, a little humorous sideline. I don't have small feet, but I remember one time going out and there was one resident who couldn't lose the fact that I had big feet. Every time I went into the tuck shop and say, you have big feet. <laughs> and I, I thought, well, I brought him some joy and some happiness anyways, at least my feet did. Well, my favorite is that week that's for Halloween, because as, as, you as, as, um, uh, uh, an elementary teacher who taught primary grades, mm -hmm. the fun of dressing up for Halloween, and of course, all those residents bring love it. Bring out those earrings, bring, bring out the, hats. the hat, and <laughs> all of those sweaters. things. So it's always it's always fun to be in that week because then you can do that little bit of different thing yeah. with the with the costume part. That's right. So, Rich, you <laughs> are president of District Three, and all this volunteering good enough. And believe me, today we only did a little tip of the iceberg. We know that. Yeah. I'm calling on you to say how you feel as president and 
of District 3 and a kind of a little overview of some of the things we did not mention. Okay. Uh, assuming that the oft quoted expression, the proof in the pudding, means that you have to experience something to realize its value or its worth, I can honestly say retired teachers of Ontario members certainly know of and have proven the benefits of community involvement. Today, you've heard a myriad of experiences undertaken by RTO members. You've seen a presence of energized individuals who give back to their community their, not only their time, but their expertise. Members care about their community and are willing to assist those who are in need. In addition to the one that we heard today, RTO has given 11 grants to local and international projects, and grants are for projects that support retired teachers give back to their communities by volunteering time and ability. And the most recent grant was uh, given to a group from Elliott Lake in the district who, <clears throat> during their presentations on puppetry, they will show that no individual in our community should ever, ever be discriminated against. And Kathy and I were there to hear them and to watch their shows, and they are fantastic. And they're going to be coming to Sault Ste. Marie in this upcoming year. Now, as you said, Bernice, we certainly have not included all the areas, but merely uh, a microscopic, no, microscopic number of events that RTO members are involved in. If we listed all the cultural support areas, that would be too expensive. We don't also <laughs> mention the churches that they're involved in, the breakfast programs, the English language programs that they assist with. It's very extensive. But further proof of our members' involvement is reflected in the results of a survey that was done, which showed that more than 70% of RTO members volunteer in their community. And not only volunteer, but they volunteer for at least five hours a week, and that's a minimum. Now, there's no proof of the origin of the phrase, the proof is in the pudding. However, there's no lack of proof of the RTO members' commitment to our community involvement. And we've heard that word commitment today very frequently. And commitment is due to the fact that volunteering is seen as rewarding, as it creates a sense of accomplishment when it leaves a good feeling inside of us. And realize that the retired Teachers of Ontario member volunteerism in Algoma is constant, it's vibrant, and it bodes well for all of our communities in Algoma at the present time, but also in the future time. And I think during this 50th year of our existence, every member of RTO and every member of our communities in Algoma should be extremely proud of each and every one of us. Well, you know what? I started this little get together with the phrase, I am a proud member of retired teachers of Ontario. And believe me, I hope that the people there watching this program can realize and appreciate why I use that phrase to commence this videotaping. I am proud. Thank you for sharing the space today. Thank you for making me part of you. And we're glad to serve because we love you, our community. It's our way of giving back. 